everybody. I am going to share this screen. So can I just check with you, Sylvia, that that's worked? Yes. Excellent. And I'm going to move you over there so it doesn't look like you're looking at me while I'm talking. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thanks for the warm welcome, Sylvia. Um, yes, as she explained, I'm a I'm a plant ecologist uh, generally uh, at work, but I have increasingly become quite fascinated with fungi and their integral role in the web of life, which, yeah, I can't get enough of that and insects as well. The more we can try and, you know, describe to everybody how important all of these intricate relationships are between the different types of organisms we can do is the best thing we can do to try and help people to conserve our native ecosystems. Um, so without further ado, I will share with you pretty much everything I know about fungi uh, and fungi photography. So this is in general what I'm going to talk about today is the importance of fungi in our ecosystems. I've uh, put that in green as a reminder for me to just reiterate uh, that, yeah, today we'll be focusing, or tonight, on on fungi that are in our native bushlands in South Australia, basically, um, because beyond that, you know, fungi are pretty much everywhere as we talk to um, school kids in particular. Um, when we're doing education, we point out that, yeah, fungi really are everywhere. They're in us as well. They're on our skin. They're in our guts. They're all over the shop, uh, inside and outside of cells. But I'm going to tone it down a little bit and just focus uh, on our native ecosystems tonight. Uh, I'll go through sort of why and how we categorise fungi, uh, which is pretty interesting given that um, there's, you know, a very big body uh, of uh, different species of fungi in the world, let alone in South Australia, and we we don't even know half of them. So that's a bit of a challenge. So we'll go through how we categorise them. Um, and then I'm just going to point out some of the features of the fungal fruiting bodies um, to give us some context. Then we'll be going on to talking about photographing fungi. So some tips on photographing fungi. And this is by, I'm an amateur photographer, as Sylvia pointed out. So this is uh, my tips that I've learned from, from largely from photographing uh, small plants as well, uh, but also increasingly fungi. Uh, and then also looking at, you know, beyond just what you can do with your camera, but um, what sorts of things we should be photographing when we're trying to get useful records that can be used for citizen science projects like the uh, Find Our Fungi uh, booklet uh, and program that we are running out at the moment. So to start off with, um, just a bit of a, a background on the importance of fungi in our ecosystems and some, some tips here for everybody. Fungi are an integral part of the web of life, um, like I said right from the start. They're not plants, uh, they are in their own kingdom, they're not animals either, um, so they really are quite unique uh, organisms. They have co-evolved with plants and have been on Earth for a very long time, so that's not some sort of new relationship that's happened here. Ever since, you know, we all got out of the ocean and we started evolving plants, uh, fungi came with, with us from the ocean, so they really are just as ancient as the plant kingdom. Over 90% of our native plants depend directly on fungi. Um, and there's lots of um, important things to talk about there, but just some that come to mind, um, some facts that um, I've picked up along the way from people that know more than me. Um, but apparently none of our trees would grow more than two metres tall if they didn't have relationships with fungi. They wouldn't have the resources to get all of the, or the networks to get all of the nutrition out of the soil uh, and the water to be able to grow more than about two metres. So that's quite amazing. Um, and like I said, most of them actually depend on them directly. So um, not just for nutrition, but also for disease protection uh, and things like that as well. And for even more sophisticated things I won't go into or we'll be here all night. But yeah, um, mother plants being able to look out after their daughter plants, um, being able to warn other plants, you know, in advance where the herbivore is coming through and change their, their chemical nature. Um, yeah, absolutely fascinating. But we'll stick to photography at the moment. Um, most of the time we don't notice fungi um, because much of the um, of the elements are microscopic uh, and also mainly they live in places where we're not looking at them. So they live in soil, they live inside plants and animals, uh, they live inside um, dead 
blogs and things like that as well. So often we can't see the main body um, of the fungi. And so they can be sort of a bit undervalued and, and a bit, uh, you know, overlooked sometimes. And obviously that's why, you know, it's a relatively new phenomenon that we're all wanting to go out and having a look. When I mean, obviously a lot of people have been doing it for years, but yeah, there's certainly been an explosion in interest um, in fungi worldwide of late. Um, and yeah, we need to learn a lot more about them. And so, like I said, we don't know much about the health of our native fungi, certainly not in the way that we understand uh, these types of things for our flora and fauna. In terms of um, trajectories of how these species are going, are they OK? Are they on the increase? Are some of them threatened? And we just don't know the answers to these. So um, this leads me to the next slide. We need to know how our fungi populations are trending so we can help protect them and the species that rely on them. That's the kicker here. If we don't look after our fungi, then all of us are going to suffer. So we really, it's really important that we do sort of get up to speed with this and get a, get a handle on how things are going. How do we categorise fungi? And I've got and why. So in the first instance, like I was just saying, there's you know, tens if not hundreds of thousands, I can't remember the exact number, of fungi species, uh, certainly in South Australia and in, uh, and in Australia, obviously worldwide as well, there's a heap too. But what I'm getting at is that there's a lot more species of fungi, just like the insects as well, than there is for plants and animals. And we don't, we, we haven't even, you know, broken up the back of that, uh, that work in trying to identify these things. So how do you talk about organisms when you don't know their names? So the way that we uh, categorise fungi is to look at their fruiting bodies. So much like a plant, when you have a flower and uh, a fruit or a, or a gum nut or something like that, the whole purpose of that is to um, to produce reproduce. Um, and so the seeds, you know, are made. You know, the the flowers get pollinated, the seeds get made, and then there's all these wild, wild and wonderful ways that plants can disperse. Uh, plant seeds into um, the rest of the bushland and help these species to keep going into the future. And that's exactly what the fruiting bodies of a fungi do as well, except that because they're not in the plant kingdom, they're in their own kingdom, they don't have seeds, they have spores. And it's a similar situation that the main thing that the fungi, which is largely living in the soil or in the tree trunks or in the leaf litter, the main thing they need to do when the conditions are right are, are to sexually reproduce, produce spores, and then get those spores out and far and wide so that the species can continue. Um, and so it's those uh, fruiting bodies that pop up in the wetter uh, and cooler months for us in winter, um, and that's when we actually get to see fungi most of the time is just at that point when they are actually trying to reproduce and disperse their spores. So I like to say fungi are like icebergs because, you know, when we look, whatever we're looking at is just the tip of the iceberg. And this, I just put this in because this amused me today when I looked up um, a diagram about fungi and saying about them being like icebergs. And then this picture came up from Kerry Lee Nelson on the left. I think that was pretty hilarious. That's not what I was after, <laughs> an ice sculpture of, <laughs> of a mushroom in the middle of Antarctica. Um but yeah, that's pretty funny. Anyway, but on the right hand side, I've, I've done a bit of a diagram to, to show what I actually meant, i.e. that most of the organism is underground and unseen. And what we are seeing when we're out there in the bushland is just um, this very special fruiting body uh, that's popped up for our enjoyment, uh, well, not probably for sp spreading spores, but certainly we all, we all get pretty excited about it uh, in winter when we're looking at these amazing different coloured, different textured you know, balls of fun that we're out hunting. So fungi fruits, um, these are the best and most useful way for us to categorise our bushland fungi. They're all different shapes uh, and orientations and different things about them that help us to categorise them in what they are. But what they're mainly doing is spreading their spores. And we can see a lot about how they're spreading their spores when we look at the shape of the fungi fruiting bodies. So let's have a look. The mushrooms. The mushrooms uh, shape is the most well recognised shape of, of fungi. We often sort of use the term fungi and mushrooms interchangeably, but mushrooms are they're certainly probably the biggest group of fungi, but there's a number of other ones as well. But we'll start with mushrooms and it's that classic, you know, cap 
uh, scenario with something underneath, usually gills, or usually quite often it's gills that are underneath, but sometimes it can be spores or paw, uh, sorry, pores uh, or little sort of tooth-like sort of things underneath. But essentially what's happening is that those gills underneath are in that sort of linear fashion so that when the wind comes through, it blows the spores out and away underneath. So it's like a bit of a veranda. It protects the spores uh, from getting too wet because, you know, clobs of spores aren't going to go very far. But if they're kept dry underneath this nice veranda, the wind can come through and spread those spores away. Uh, in, you know, throughout the rest of the bushland. And so that's the sort of generic shape that we've got, but there's so many different um, combinations in terms of colour, texture, is it dry, is it gloopy, all that sort of thing. And the colour obviously is a big thing as well. And also, like I said, sometimes there's different things underneath. Um, so that's part of what we need to have. But there's a lot to look at with the mushrooms because there's so many of them, not to mention you know, how many times people have come into our office and asked, can I eat this? <laughs> There's a whole heap, apparently a whole category of brown mushrooms that, you know, you cannot tell the difference between them. So, you know, there's such a diversity of this mushroom shape. Earth stars, they're pretty groovy. Um, so the earth stars, uh, there's a bit of variation, but in general, you've got this sack in the middle of it. Um, and so it sits there and it's got a, an opening at the top. Um, can I use my, oh, here we go, yep. So this little opening here, when they're mature enough to, to um, be ready to spread the spores, uh, generally it's uh, the plops of rain, I believe, that, uh, you know, and I, I wonder how much uh, strong wind might do this as well. But when you get that sort of movement on this sack here, it puffs the spores out of that hole and gets them on their trajectory to spreading out through the bushland as well. So these earth stars, there's, there's a number of different um, shapes, but essentially there's a like that inner, inner sort of area where the sac is going to form. And then there's often a, a sort of a cr crust around on the outside, like a, sorry, another layer. And that uh, in some of them, that sort of isn't very substantial and all you see is the sac. Or in the case of this one, it's obviously split and that's peeled back and left as a bit of a star. And then we've got some more that we'll be looking at some photos later where that, that folding back continues and ends up lifting the spore sack up off the ground, which is pretty amazing as well. So that's the basic structure of the earth stars. Jellies are pretty cool. They've pretty much just got the spores um, being uh, sort of washed away with water, I would say, a bit more as well uh, as wind um, in getting the spores out. They've got a nice sort of brain-like look on them, which probably just increases the surface area for making more spore production and getting them out into the bushland. Often some wild and wonderful colours. The earth balls are pretty cool. Um, the top one there is awesome. You can see that it's got purple spores, which is uh, another thing to have a look for when we're looking probably at all the fungi. Sometimes um, they can be a bit hard to see, but in this instance, you can get, you know, quite clumps of the spores coming out and you get a good look at what colour they are. The brackets. Um, often on dead logs or on um, tree trunks. These have quite a, often a similar sort of structure as the mushrooms, but there's no stem. And they're just, you know, attached straight on to uh, the side of the, on the wood of the log or of the tree. Um, but same sort of thing that they've got a bit of a veranda structure. And then they've got uh, the spores uh, in the casing underneath that have been protected from the rain. Um, but then, you know, they either have the wind going through the gills or, as the case in this bottom left one here, you can see that that's got pores and they would be falling out there and then going away um, with the wind. Corals, this is another example of sort of like the jellies in that there's, the spores are sort of just on the surface, but you can see the structures that they've got now are really about trying to increase the surface area uh, to disseminate disseminate those spores as well. And with these ones, when you're looking at what different ones are, you can see that the one down the bottom is finer and a lighter colour. So you do get a variation in colour with these ones, but also some, some of them, like the one at the top right, is a little bit more chunky. Um, 
other than those sorts of shapes, they can be difficult to distinguish. Discs and cups, um, these are sort of uh, fleshy type little cups that again, um, they're often quite small. Um, got the fleshy ground cup on the left, so another different form for maybe some water to drop down into those cups as well. Could be another way that the spores could be splashed out uh, into, into the air. There's other very specific um, types of fungal bodies than these, but I'm just going to maybe leave it there because you get the picture. Um, you're looking at that structure, you're looking at colour and texture um, and how they're actually getting those, those spores out. And quite often, um, just coming to mind now, and with some of them, the way that the fungi looks at the start when it's first coming out, the shape and colour can be quite different to when it's old as well. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So that leads us on to what are the important features that we're trying to have a look at with fungi. I've covered some of these already, some of the just general features. The surfaces above and below, so we've really got to get down on the ground um, and have a look underneath um, at what's going on that, to do with colour as well and whether you've got gills or pores underneath. Um, the side, side profile is in because I'm now starting to come at this with what would be, be photographing. Um, the side profile can be important. That will show you, like in that particular example there, we can see the white gills already there and the way that the gills attach to the stem can be something that is important to give you an idea of what species you've got. Getting uh, shots of a range of the maturity of the fungi is important. Like I just said, it can change as they as they grow. And this is a real classic. So this is the fly agaric, the, the classic fairy toad stool. When they're really little, they're really quite a bright colour. And those little warty bits that are on them are often quite close together because they are actually a, um, uh, a remnant of a veil that covered that whole um, fruiting body as it was coming up through the so uh, soil and protecting the gills and that. And so then as it grows and expands, that all sort of starts to crack and separate and you get those little warty blobs on the top. Uh, size uh, is another thing that's important to have a look at. And substrate, which is basically what is it growing upon. In this case, this is a good example. Another thing that helps me know that that's a fly agaric is because it's on pine needles and that's a particular uh, fungi that does have a relationship generally with pine trees. Um, colour is important and the texture is important as well. A lot of them are shiny. This one here is a bit more sort of dry looking. So this is an example of a bit of a diagram showing some of the terminology for those things I was just talking about. So the warts on the top over here. Yeah, this is a, a remnant of the often the um, the main veil, this, some of them have a membrane that goes around the whole thing when they're little as they push up and then it splits down the bottom here like that and then here's some examples here, some little remnants of the torn veil and then the other bits sort of stick like tissue paper that's been stretched on the top of the mushroom there. Sometimes they have a partial veil where it goes over there and just underneath here to protect the gills in particular. And when that happens, you end up with remnant of what we call a skirt, but it's a bit of a, of a what they call a partial veil. So that's another feature to look out for when you that you need to photograph if you're trying to show what species something is. Um, we know we've talked about gills and pores. Um, and the ring on the, and then the stem down here as well. So how the gills attach is important, whether it's got a skirt or not, what colour is the stem. Quite often the, as the spores come out, some of them stick to this skirt and that gives you an idea of what the spore colours are. Um, yeah, so that's some more specific sort of features that we're looking at. So here you can see one of the things you might be wanting to capture in a photograph is the edge of a mushroom. You know, that seems like quite a distinctive feature to me here and you get to see what colour the gills are underneath. Right, cracking into some tips on photography. So what features do we need to capture in our photos? Uh, first of all, with using the camera, um, I know some people like to use um, a, a, like an SLR camera, that's what I use for a lot of things, but I don't use it as much in fungi photography because the light can be an issue. 
Um, and I find I'm a bit miffed about this because of, you know, I've built up all my skills in my SLR, but it is often quite a lot easier to capture photos on your phone these days. The phones are amazing. They often has, have this focal stacking software, so you get like this amazing depth of focus. Um, and also, if you're looking at, at putting up records to iNaturalist, um, we can, you know, the, you've already got the GPS location attached to the photograph in the metadata, and you can upload straight onto iNaturalist. So the phone can be really helpful there. Um, please make sure that you've got some in, images that are in focus. That's really frustrating when you end up back at home and the photos aren't in focus. Um, and another one here, uh, just as a bit of a reminder, you, you need to get down to ground level. I think sometimes it's a bit of a, um, you know, people just want to take a photo from above, but you really get a lot more information and I think a much better photograph when you're down uh, at ground level. So framing and focus. Uh, this is these are some photos from a recent field trip where I got quite excited because we were looking at um, grazing um, uh, amount of grazing around some dams up in um, the Mallee in South Australia. Uh, and so we we're looking at what sort of herbivores we had and I started looking at the poo, obviously, and the goat poo and that. And then I found this uh, uh, small dung button growing on the kangaroo poo. It was very excited. So I thought I'd whack some photos in of this. This is just in terms of the way that you're, and, you know, this is, depends on how much you know your camera. But I think the photo on the left is much better than the one on the right. They're both in focus. Um, but the one on the left has got this sort of um, the depth of field is just pretty much on what you're looking at there. The background's in blurred, the front, the foreground's blurred, and there's just the right amount of light coming down and you really, your eye is drawn to this part of the photo and the little uh, fungi that are growing there on the poo. Whereas this one over here, um, even the orientation of it, um, you know, it's a little bit harder to draw your eye to what, you know, you want to be looking at. There's a bit more in focus around it and it's a bit darker. So those types of things can be really important in terms of making the photo look really attractive. Another one that I notice when I'm out and about, and this is a matter of personal preference, is whether to have the sunlight on or the shade. Now, in a lot of instances, you've just got shade, 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 haven't you, because you're in a woodland or a forest. Um, but these were taken up in the Mallee, and we also have fungi in our grasslands here too, so we've quite often got that, that aspect. In general, uh, I like having it in the shade, so the top right one is my, my preference. It's not the shadow effect, and uh, it's sort of easier to see, but that's another thing to work out what is your preference when you're taking photos. And just a few more bits of information um, about what actual features that you need to get for identification purposes when you're wanting to upload things to iNaturalist like for our, science, our Citizen Science Project. So really good to bring a mirror because like I was talking about before, what's underneath the mushroom? Some of them are nice and, you know, doing the right thing for you and they're up on the edge of a tree, but quite often they're way down on the ground. And just so that we don't disturb them, um, yeah, you can put a, a mirror underneath like you can see there on that split gill and have a look at what's going on underneath. So you need a scale, something that helps to inform someone else that hasn't been there to, to give, get a good idea of how, how big it is. You need a camera, of course. Um, and if you're doing uh, our particular project anyway, it's good to have downloaded the iNaturalist app so that you can do all of that in the field and you're much more likely to get all the information that you need and get it captured. So just now we'll go through some examples. Um, I love this shot, nice, warm, warm, lovely shot of this beautiful fungi. But of course, coming back later on to wonder what it is, I've got no idea what's underneath. So that's another thing to keep in mind. This, <laughs> These next few photos are not a new, new to science species. It's actually um, one of our artists up in the Riverland um, put together some fungi models for us for when we're doing um, education exercises or uh, shows where so that we can show people what fungi look like. So this is this is quite, this someone's actually made this an artist, um, and it means also because kids that like to come in have a look at the fungi, the first they want to do is touch them, and that's not always the best thing to do either for kids. So that's why these models were made, and I've used them today to illustrate a few more things. But like I said, you know, important to know what's going underneath. Um, what do we do? we get down at ground level. And you can even see, even on this model, just that difference of what you get rather than just trying to have a bit of a look from the side as to when you get right down low. So that's one way of doing it. 
And another way is to use your mirror. And one of the things um, to keep in mind here, if you've got your mirror on the ground, but make sure that you actually use it when you're doing the automatic focus, that you're focusing on the mirror. Because also I've seen photographs where people have done that and yet the, <laughs> the mirror's out of focus, so it hasn't helped. Here's another one, has it got gills or paws? If you don't check your focus, this is reason, you know, you have a bit of a guess here, but you wouldn't exactly know whether you've got, you know, the little um, stalactite things that can be underneath or paws. But when you get, make sure that you've got it in focus, you've, you know, you've got a much better specimen for someone else to be double checking what your species is. This one, how big is this fungi? If there's no scale there, you've really got, again, someone else might, you know, might want to know exactly how big this species is so that they can do an identification. Um, but there's nothing there. And there's a number of different things you can do. If you don't have a, a, a proper scale, you can use a coin like I've done there, um, you know, just put anything that's something that people know. So a pencil's obviously a really readily thing that you can use. That's um, the, they're the um, little hand mirrors that we've got from Fungi Map. So over here anyway, if you sent something in with that mirror, <laughs> the people at Fungi Map would know exactly how wide they are. Uh, and or if you're really lucky, uh, like on our Find Our Fungi little booklet, we've included a handy little ruler that's just printed on the um, on the booklet, but it's to scale too, and that helps too when you're out and about to show you how big they are. I probably just whiz through. If I've got, how am I going, Sylvia? Can I just whiz through a couple of examples? I've got five minutes, right? So here's I've got some pictures of some things that are similar, and so this is where it's really important to get the features that you want. We've got the vermilion grisette on the left, which is native to, to Australia, so native in South Australia here versus the fly agaric, which isn't. They've both got a ready orange colour. They've both got the warts on the top. But you've, this is about knowing what are the features that you need to show. And on the vermilion grisette, they, we, we know that they've got an orange ring at the base. So that's been captured in this photo, which is great. Um, but the other thing that we needed to look at was whether there was a skirt on the stem. Now over here we can see the skirt here, the, the remnants of the little veil is on that one, but you wouldn't be completely sure with that one there on this one. So that's not a great photo on its own. But if you take another one, here's a much older, scungier looking one. Uh, again, not so good on this photo, but this is where, this is exactly what you want. Now you're feeling nice and confident that there's no skirt on this, and then you're more confident of that species identification. Here's two more similar ones that we have. Both of them are tiny orange little pin looking things. Um, but we know from our booklet that one of these species, the one on the left, the yellow navel, will always grow on an algal substrate and the orange moss cap always grows in moss. So in this instance, it's probably not so much the, the fungi that we need to photograph, but we want to make sure that we've got proof of what it's growing on. And like I've said there too, a scale would have been useful on those um, as well. And these are the last two that we've got that are, are similar. We've got these arched earth star and a beaked earth star. This one's quite tricky, actually. It's a good example of really needing to know exactly what you want to capture because the size is not very different. One's six centimetres across, one's five. But this one here has got this distinctive sort of pattern underneath it. I can see the edge of it here. But if it was me out in the field and you had the opportunity, it would be good to even get a little bit further down and look up and have a good look at that. Um, and you need to know the shape of the beak here and the length of the little stem that it's got on there is important as well. And again, what also would be very useful here is a scale. And you might actually do an up and down scale, not just one on the on the ground. So final tips, get down on the ground because the angle is better. Take a mirror with you and something to use as a scale. Work with the light you've got. Um, it's quite hard and when it, it can be really dark. Um, I quite often haven't been able to sort that out with my own SLR, but for people that are more proficient with the use of their camera, you would probably bring in some reflective um, card that you can get to put around or look at lighting. Other than that, though, the phones, mobile phones these days are amazing for that. Try and have the background blurred, especially if you've got something that's quite similar to what's behind it. It really makes a difference if you've just got your fungi in focus and nothing else. Um, I've just got try and capture as many features you can in a photo. If you're putting records up into iNaturalist, it's sort of I think if you can, you know, capture if there's five things to capture and you only need two or three photos, that can be good. 
and check your shots are in focus before you leave. It's very important as well. And take your Find Our Fungi booklet with you if you're in our region because it's got all of this information in it there already. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Nicola. We didn't have anyone pop questions in the chat, but does anyone have any question? And it looks like we're lucky enough to have Jasmine <laughs> <laughs> Jasmine Packer on here with us too. Might be able to help us out with some tricky questions. Um, uh, so well, someone don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> yep. uh, I have. Okay, Marilyn. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I just wondering about. I don't know what the proper name is, but a fungi that glow in the dark, um, and the best way to take a photo of them. Please. Uh, Yes, so the fungi that grow in the dark, the ghost uh, ghost fungi, um, Omphalotus nidiformis, we've got here. I don't know if there's additional species, and Jasmine will know more about that than me. Um, it will have specific features that are in our booklet that tell us what to capture. Um, I'm not sure whether you need to actually capture it glowing or not, but one of the things that I learned when I was doing, um, you know, first learning about these things is they don't just glow in the dark, they glow all the time. So one of the things you can do if you if you if you've got you know a big jacket or something with you if you can really sort of put it over you and get some darkness you should be able to see whether it's glowing or not then already, um, and that will help you feel more confident about your identification. And I was just wondering about the actual photography um, because I tried it very recently and I, I, it wasn't coming out very much at all uh, either on a phone or an SLR. I think that um, people use like long uh, exposure for those kind of yeah. like really glowing photography. I'm not really sure how it's done, but that's normally the ones that are really bright, have this long exposure. So you leave your camera recording yep. for a little. I'm not, but yeah, yeah, we that's have normally the case. Do we have anyone okay. else on here who has successfully taken photos of ghost fungi? I haven't, yes. but I know there's people out there that have. <laughs> Yes, I have. Only oh, recently what? we were in uh, Mount Gambia in Ghost Mushroom Lane uh, and the, what we found is to go as dark and late at night as you can, well, best mm -hmm. of all to go when it's light so that you can find them. The rangers do their best to put markers for healthy ones during the day because it changes. Um, mm -hmm. They get eaten quite quickly. Um, so then once you sort of have an idea of where they are during the day, you can go back at night. The darker, the better. Any tiny little bit of light is going to impact, but long exposure, I did it on my Android phone. Uh, the longer you can leave it exposed, the better. I tried for about five minutes and got quite a healthy glow. Mm -hmm. However, there are so many people with their torches, so the tiniest little bit of light does impact, but I did manage to get quite... Um, a couple of decent photos, but again, having a, a tripod and keeping it as still as possible with the longest exposure you can manage without someone's torch. Um, and that's usually, there's a few, if you just type in on Google, um, some pointers for capturing ghost fungi, uh, mm -hmm. they'll, on, on your particular phone, they'll have some quick step-by-step -step instructions, which is all I did in the car park <laughs> to, right, uh, okay, to to get some help. And Thank you. Nicola, Steve Chappell here. If you're using an SLR, we do a lot of it up here in the Limestone Coast. If you're using an SLR, uh, depending on the lens that you're using, we're around about F uh, 4.5, somewhere around there, a reasonably low, but not too low in f-stop so that you don't get it out of focus. Mm -hmm. We're running at about 90 seconds uh, at ISO okay. 2500, depending on your camera, if, you, if your camera can do that, around 2500. Um, as they say, make sure you get your focus first. So you'll need to use a torch or something to get your focal point mm. first. And if you can, turn off your focus so it doesn't try and do it in the dark. But yeah, yeah we've been quite successful with those rough settings. And most of us are oh, using... Thank you either a 100 mil macro lens or something, you know, around that that's got a reasonably yeah. low f-stop availability yeah. on it. So, and they, they said tripod and a trigger so that you don't shake it while you're yeah. going. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Nicola, just while I was speaking, can I ask where you're based? Speed Chapel just asked. I yes, I am at home in Bridgewater at the moment, but uh, usually uh, the at the office I'm in the Murray Bridge office. So okay, I work for thanks. the Murray Lands and Riverland Landscape Board, just like Alice and Sylvia as well. Oh, that's all right. We've got the herbarium from Adelaide uh, and the botanics botanist coming down because uh, we found one last year and they've done some dissection and some DNA or whatever they do on it, and it's not been found before. And they're going to come down in about uh, two weeks. There's only about 15 of them in this location, um, and they're going to come down and do a session on it. So I might send you some information on that in case you have the opportunity to get down as well. Wonderful. Excellent. I just might just answer a couple of questions here. Um, there's a few people asking about our fungi booklet. Um, I've got another slide at the end that'll go through this, but I'll just let you know now we are, we do, our fungi booklets just being, uh, the second edition is just being printed right now. It'll be available in a week or so, and we're very happy to send everyone on here uh, one of our booklets. Um, oh. So even if you're not not in our region, um, it's got some useful tips on how to use iNaturalist and and also how to look for different types of fungi and the kind of features to look out for, just like Nicola just went through. So you're all very welcome to have a copy of that. So we'll be sending an email to everyone with that and a few other bits and pieces of information, including uh, links to a video that Nicola and Jasmine made about how to upload this information to iNaturalist as well. We didn't have enough time oh. tonight to go through all of it, but there is already a video made for that. So we'll send you the links to that. Good. Thank you. Um, there was another question. Ah, does anyone know if there's ghost mushrooms in New South Wales? Yes. I don't know. Yes. Very good. Yes. There we go. I found them in Jamboree. <laughs> have any other questions before we wrap up? Someone um, asked if there was a PDF version. Yes, we don't have one currently, but we can send, happy to send hard copies, but we can also make a PDF version, um, which will be available on the website. But we all, we've done a big print run, so we're very happy to, to send out hard copies, which is much more useful in the field, mm. I would think. Generally, I like a hard copy in, in the field. Um, yes, so we're happy to send them send them out. I might just go to my last slide just to wrap up. If anyone's got any burning questions still. Um, I think we, we should have everyone that's registered, we should have their email addresses um, from the registration. But thank you. The, um, I'll, when I send out an email about tonight, if you can respond with your physical address that you'd like the fungi booklet to go to, then I can, I have a record of the ones that we're sending out. So then they'll be sent out soonish. <laughs> yes, thanks everyone. So I just wanted to say if you are in our region in particular, um, or you ever visit our region in the Mallee and the Riverland, uh, we'd love you to join our Find Our Fungi project. But the Fungi Map project on iNaturalist covers the whole of Australia. So wherever you are, please join Fungi Map and put your fungi photos on iNaturalist. And yes, a big shout out for the Fungi Quest, which is a national um, event that Fungi Map runs. And May is the particular time of year when Fungi Quest runs. So everyone across Australia, please put as many photos as you can onto iNaturalist during this time, autumn being a, the perfect time to go fungi hunting. So I hope you all have fun with that. If you are in our region, the Murray Lands and Riverland is one of their focus areas for Fungi Quest this year. And another plug for another iNaturalist project, which is the City Nature Challenge, where you can put on any photos of any plant, animal or fungi um, on, onto iNaturalist. So if you haven't used iNaturalist before and you want to give it a go this weekend, if you want to join City Nature Challenge, that would be a great time to go out and just take photos of whatever you can find. Again, no matter what it is, the more features you can include in your photos, the easier it is for someone to identify it and hopefully get it to a research grade identification as well. Uh, Greater Adelaide is part of City Nature Challenge, but there's also a range of other cities um, across the world that are part of it. So look up, we'll send you links to that as well. So yes, we'll send you an email after this. 
uh, with links to the video on how to upload iNaturalist uh, to the Fungi Map site. We will post you, ask if you'd like us to post you how to find our fungi booklet. Uh, and also, if you're also in our region or can travel to our region, we do have a Mali Bio Blitz at Yukamara on May the 13th, where we'll be looking for fungi and a range of other things uh, as part of the Fungi Quest. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, <laughs> okay, I've got a comment, comment here. Um, are useful to have a cross section of a fruiting body? Is it useful to have a cross section of a fruit body when taking photos? I guess that kind of brings up the issue of should you touch them or not? Which, <laughs> um, Nicola, would you like, or Jasmine, would you like to comment on that one? Uh, I don't think you need that. Um, not I don't think, you don't need it. The, the thing, um, I guess there's two things here. One is if you're looking at um, our particular project where we've specifically picked out these species, it was originally 10 and now we've got 20 species that have been picked out on purpose because they will be found in the area that we've said they would be um, or that they are present there. And also you can identify them with the naked eye so you don't need to have anything microscopic or um, overly scientific, just the things that we've been talking about. And there's some tips in the booklet about exactly which features um, will help you to feel confident you've got that ID right. Um, and I think probably for anything else, I I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, we don't generally recommend that people disturb them um, or pick them or anything. Uh, a lot of uh, fungi, um, I want to say a lot of fungi, some fungi are obviously poisonous, but a much bigger range of fungi are not necessarily going to kill you, but they might not make you feel very well either. And, um, yeah, and the other thing with that too, just as, a, I guess, a general comment about, you know, being out in the community is if when people do that sort of thing early on, then it's not there for the next person to have a look at. So like, that's just where we're coming from. I'd, I'd, we would be advocating for people leaving them there. Thank you, Nicola. If, do you have any last questions? before we wrap up. Looking good. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And thank you, Nicola. And thank you, Alice, Worries. for behind the scenes. <laughs> uh, and I wish everyone all the best on their fungi hunting this autumn.